This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Aaron Maté. Our guests are Juan Garces, who also has written a book simply called Allende, about the president who he advised, his closest advisor until September 11th, 40 years ago, 1973, when the palace was being bombed by the Pinochet forces, and Salvador Allende took his own life. He was surrounded by his other advisors, but he walked Juan Garces to the door and said, tell the world. John Garces went on, as a Spanish lawyer, to work to hold Pinochet responsible. And ultimately, through Baltasar Garcon, the Spanish judge, had him, had him call for Augusto Pinochet's extradition to Spain to be tried. Augusto Pinochet was in London, and Augusto Pinochet was held for about a year there before ultimately he was allowed to return home to Chile. We're also joined by Peter Kornblu, author of the Pinochet file, Declassified Dossier on Atrocity and Accountability. I was just speaking about Joyce Horman, um, the widow of uh, the freelance journalist Charlie Horman. Uh, Peter Kornblu, tell us what Charlie discovered in those days leading up to the coup, why he was so dangerous, and what you learned um, uh, in declassification of documents of uh, Kissinger. Well, Charles Horman and, and his wife Joyce were uh, part of a large group of, of Americans who went to Chile during the Allende years. Chile was, a, as, as Juan Garcés will tell us, was a dynamic, exciting place. The whole world was watching what was happening there. It was something new and vibrant. Um, and uh, what was it? What was happening? I mean, the, so v, a new the, via, was the famous elected. Via Pacifica of, of towards towards social change, um, not armed revolution uh, to bring uh, fundamental change to a third world country, but democratic revolution um, in which uh, the people would vote. Uh, and institutions would gradually be changed to, to spread the wealth equally, to nationalize uh, resources uh, uh, so that uh, U.S. copper companies and corporations like IT&T didn't suck the uh, money right out of the country. Um, this was an exciting um, new model of change for Latin America and the world. That's what made it so dangerous uh, for uh, the Nixon and Kissingers of, of, of the world. Um, so Charlie and, and, and his wife Joyce were there. Charles Horman was actually, uh, as part of his journalistic approach, he was actually investigating the, the murder of the Chilean commander-in-chief, General Rene Schneider, that took place in October of 1970, and was part of a CIA operation to foment a coup, to create a coup climate in Chile that might stop Allende from actually being inaugurated the first week of November. Um, this was an atrocity, a bald assassination of the commander in chief of the Chilean Armed Forces right in broad daylight on the streets. Um, there was a trial that had taken place in Chile. There were documents that really did um, focus on, on, on the contact with the United States and the coup plotters. Uh, in my book, The Pinochet File, I have one still secret CIA document, um, which reveals that the agency paid. Uh, the people that killed Rene Schneider, $35,000 to close their mouths about the U.S. role and to help them escape from Chile uh, to get beyond the, the, the grasp of justice. But some people were arrested, um, tried. Charlie Horman was investigating that, looking at the trial file. He also happened to be in Valparaiso on the day of the coup and met um, a Where number of U.S. officials. Valparaiso is a coastal, very famous coastal town. He went to Viña del Mar, he went to Valparaiso. It was um, where the U.S. Uh, Navy um, uh, uh, group that was uh, advising the Chilean military Known was the U.S. Mill based. Group. The U.S. Mill Group was there. He met the head of the U.S. Mill Group, Captain Ray Davis, who actually drove him and uh, a companion back to Santiago because there was a curfew. And so the implication was is that he had talked to these Americans that he might actually know something about about the coup. It is still a, 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 the details of his death and, and why. Uh, he was killed are, are still murky, and the case is going forward. And actually, almost 40 years later, a Chilean judge actually indicted Captain Ray Davis, the head of the U.S. Mill Group, uh, for his death. So we are hoping in the months to come that we learn more about the circumstances uh, under which he died. Uh, Peter, the role of the ITT Corporation, this huge U.S. firm that had a lot of interests in Chile. 
ITT uh, owned the telephone companies in Chile. They owned the Sheraton Hotel. Um, they were a very aggressive company uh, in, in Latin America. Uh, and they decided they should have their own foreign policy, and they started uh, pushing for meetings with the uh, with the, uh, the the CIA, it helped that they had on their board of directors a former CIA director, John McCone, and he was able to gain access to uh, to the CIA rather easily. Um, there was more than 40 meetings between CIA officials and ITT officials. ITT wanted to start funneling secret funds to Allende's opponent in the 1970 election. Um, uh, one of the for, for students of this history, the first real documents that came out on U.S. intervention in Chile were ITT internal memos that recorded their meetings with the CIA and the U.S. ambassador, as your um, as your audience heard in, in the tape that was that was that was played on your program. Uh, so this was our, the first kind of real inkling of, of what was happening. The scandal arose. Juan Garcés can re remember what happened because Allende was president at the time, and he simply declared, well, we were negotiating to nationalize and compensate ITT, but now that we see they're a completely criminal enterprise intervening with the CIA in our internal state of affairs, we're going to uh, expropriate their, their holdings in Chile. And how, John Garces, uh, was Allende dealing with ITT, Kissinger, Nixon? What did he understand was their role in supporting Pinochet? Did he? Well, uh, Allende wanted always a good agreement with the United States. And uh, certainly he said that uh, he, he should. Uh, govern in, a, in conformity with the willingness of the Chilean people, of the Chilean Congress, but looking for a way uh, to preserve the good relations with the United States. And, in fact, several months before the coup, a high delegation uh, from Chile came to Washington uh, to open uh, formal negotiations to try to solve the uh, differences that, uh, in terms of investments or in terms of uh, economic relations, were present in this in this period, and the uh, doors of the U.S. government in, wa in Washington were practically closed. No dialogue, no negotiation, coup d'état. So, uh, what is uh, in, in 40 years later, what is interesting is that you see this coup d'etat against a very active democratic society uh, articulated by an operation where one of the legs is a mass media group, El Mercurio, asking the intervention of the U.S. government through secret services in relation with some corporations that have private investments in Chile. And with do, the, those three leaks, uh, excuse me, uh, leaks, uh, the, the coup uh, the destabilization of the society was done. Now, with the technological uh, means that currently are uh, uh, at our disposal, at the disposal of the government, you realize that the three legs are still working. Corporations uh, that uh, uh, link, uh, have links with secret services, and uh, the uh, articulation with uh, the government, the government, to uh, prepare interventions in other countries, invasions, and uh, uh, that has been the case, of particularly after the tragedy of the attack to New York in 2001, but uh, the balance that uh, we can do, and many countries do, and the United States citizens are doing also, is what is the cost of those options to follow this path uh, for the economy of our countries and for the health, uh, the health of our democratic system. I wanted to ask about something remarkable that um, you did in your efforts to bring justice to the people of Chile and to uh, hold Pinochet accountable, and that was to get at his money, which was the people's money of Chile, the millions of dollars he'd stashed away. Uh, Peter, first, Peter Kornblou, um, sort of lay this out for an American audience. Uh, talk about the story of Riggs Bank. Well, let me just say it's such a pleasure to be on, on the show with Juan Garces for what he did during the Allende period and what he did to bring Pinochet to justice and then what he did to uh, really try and recover the money that Pinochet had clearly stolen and hidden away uh, in secret bank accounts. 
uh, the CIA documents on, on Pinochet he described him as hardworking and honest, but it turns out that he was completely corrupt as uh, in addition to being murderous. Uh, and he uh, secretly took uh, more than $26 million of Chilean money, hid it in 120 bank accounts, some of, many of them offshore accounts, using false passports, the images of, with, of which are, are in the new edition of, of the Pinochet file, um, and using kind of variants of his name, but without the name Pinochet, uh, to try and hide the fact that these are his assets. Like? Uh, he, he, is, he used the name Augusto Ugarte Pe, or simply Augusto Ugarte, or Ramon Ugarte, because his full name was Augusto Ramon Ugarte Pinochet, no, or Pinochet Ugarte. Right. right. Uh, and, and, and some other false names. And he had some of his aides' uh, names, uh, and he had some of his the variants of his uh, children's names on these accounts. And um, Riggs Bank, uh, the famous bank of Washington, D.C., owned by Joseph Albritton, um, had approached Pinochet uh, uh, for years, and at some one point they actually held the secret, uh, the, the accounts of the Chilean secret police, Dina, uh, uh, in their uh, in their bank in Washington. Um, but uh, eventually, U.S. Senate, uh, th this was the most amazing thing, U.S. The Senate investigation, kind of looking at whether banks had tight enough regulations on money laundering by terrorists after 9-11, stumbled across the fact that Riggs Bank was hiding all of these funds from, from Pinochet, and they recovered the, almost the entire file. The, the, the How did they discover it? They were investigating banks and whether they were, uh, their regulations were so loose that terrorists in the post-9-11 world could launder money for terrorist activities. They were looking for the, the, the financial side of terrorism in the post-9-11 world. And so they were looking for accounts that were suspicious. They started an investigation, and immediately they were told that in Riggs Bank there were a series of people that knew that there was this very suspicious account that belonged to Augusto Pinochet. And they asked for the file on it, and eventually they got the entire file, which was so incredible because it included all the correspondence between Joseph Albright and the chairman of the board of the, of the bank and Pinochet himself, and the memorandum on the visits by bank officials to Pinochet and other Chilean officials in Santiago, including going to horse clubs and equestrian shows and exchanging gifts and cufflinks. And, and who was Joseph Albright? I mean, well, Joseph Albright was one of the, the big uh, banking corporate moguls of Washington, D.C. Um, he owned uh, the sports team, I forget uh, whether it was the basketball team or the Redskins. Um, uh, at one point, uh, he owned uh, a bunch of newspapers and radio stations. He owned Riggs Bank. Um, but fundamentally, he participated in a conspiracy to hide Augusto Pinochet's money. Uh, and uh, he, they evaded the assets. The, the Juan Garces managed to get Pinochet's assets frozen, but Riggs Bank violated that court order to freeze his assets by secretly starting to funnel back to him all of his money in, in $50,000 cashier's checks. They had a courier that would bring, literally, bundles of these checks to Pinochet's house in Santiago. Um, and the story returned to Juan Garces because more than $8 million of this 20-plus uh, million stash of money was given back to Pinochet illegally by Riggs. Uh, and Juan Garcés stepped in and said that money belongs to the Chilean people and to the victims of Pinochet, and he recovered it. Albritton's son is now runs Politico. Albritton owned, started Politico, um, uh, uh, created Politico, um, and then when he passed away, his son uh, took over. Uh, so he's, there's, there's still a presence of, of, of the family. Yeah. So you got, Juan Garcés, millions of dollars of Chile's money um, frozen. And then how was it distributed back to the people of Chile? Thanks to an investigation uh, in the U.S. Senate, as Peter was explaining. Led by the, senator Carl Levin of, uh, uh, of, yeah. of, of Michigan, a terrific the, senator. The Under Committee on Investigations. And they uh, accepted to cooperate with the Court of Justice that was uh, uh, prosecuting Pinochet. And thanks to this cooperation we, we, between the U.S. Senate and the Spanish court, uh, uh, we reached to indict the, uh, the owners of the Riggs Bank 
that in a, something that is without precedent from their own pocket uh, uh, paid the totality of the money that went through the bank channels uh, hitting the Pinochet money and we distributed that to the victims of Pinochet that were uh, considered such with this status in the court. It is the only money that, uh, uh, that uh, related direct, directly to Pinochet has never been distributed to the victims. But that money, the millions of dollars, how did you identify the, sur the victims, um, the survivors, and have it distributed? That was uh, f mm, there, the victims were recognized as such in the court because uh, uh, thousands of them have been uh, uh, the object of an inquiry inside Chile by an official uh, commission, uh, committee rigs, uh, that established the list of thousands of people that were murdered or disar forced disappeared. And uh, we in Spain, with the cooperation of Chileans inside Chile, created a new commission for victims of torture, victims that uh, survived the torture. And we uh, found, uh, through this commission, uh, identified more than 20,000 uh, persons. And uh, then they, they have the right to receive a part of the indemnities. Taking this forward, um, how you got Pinochet, how you got him arrested in England. Um, we just went all to a big event last night um, where you, Juan Garces, you, Peter Cornblue, um, uh, Baltasar Garzón, the Spanish judge, and others were honored in this 40th anniversary of this other 9-11, September 11, 1973, when Pinochet rose to power in Chile. Um, you left the palace, taking the word of what happened there, September 11, 1973, as President Allende asked you to do, and you went forth. You were actually born in Spain. You ultimately went to Spain. Um, you were a lawyer. How did you get Pinochet arrested in England? It's a matter of conviction. This man was a criminal, of course, and deserves to uh, make uh, to be made accountable for the, those crimes. So uh, someone said to, to kill him. There was a, an attempt uh, against his life. Uh, my way of thinking is different, is uh, to work, to collect, uh, to gather evidences about the, his crimes, to look for a court of justice, and wait for the moment in which the political conditions could make him accountable. Uh, and that happened after the end of the Cold War. And uh, we applied international uh, treaties, uh, European Convention on Extradition, and the International Convention Against uh, Torture. And we found the courts in Europe and uh, applied the principles of universal jurisdiction. And we got Pinochet. And uh, the difference between a killing, a murder, and a legal proceeding you can see here the consequences. Had he been killed in the attempted assassination uh, in, uh, in 1960, 1986, things in Chile will be very different or what has come after the legal proceeding where the crimes were openly explained in front of an independent court and the Chilean society uh, since then. Uh, Pinochet was arrested in 1999, and since then until now, uh, uh, the big majority of Chileans agree that the transition to democracy in Chile begins the day in which Pinochet, Pinochet was put in front of a, tri of a court of justice. Um, Peter Cornblue, uh, if you can uh, talk about uh, this remarkable event from a U.S. perspective, um, what actually took place. So, 73, uh, Pinochet rises to power. He rules for 17 years. In 1989, he goes to the doctor in London. He's also what meeting with the former Prime Minister Thatcher, and he is certainly treated as a dignitary. Um, where were you when he was arrested? In 1998. Uh, October 16th, 
Uh, it was a day that everybody in the Chile community remembers. Uh, General Pinochet, because of the work of Juan Garcés uh, and Balthazar Garzón uh, and some key people in London, uh, take advantage of the fact that Pinochet is having a kind of minor surgery uh, at a place called the Clinic uh, in London. Um, and they file a, uh, a request for his arrest under the European uh, Counterterrorism Convention because Pinochet committed major acts of international terrorism. He spearheaded Operation Condor, which was a rendition, kidnapping, assassination program around the world. He murdered Orlando Letelier uh, and Ronnie Moffat in Washington, D.C. The former Chilean ambassador the to the United Chilean States. former Chilean ambassador, a friend of Juan Garcés's. Um, in 1976, in on 19 Embassy Row in Washington, D.C. That's exactly right. So. Uh, these new laws that had come into place uh, facilitated a request for his interrogation and, and arrest. Um, and this was a transformational moment. It was a transformational moment for, for Chileans. It was a transformational moment for people in the United States. It was a transformational moment for the human rights movement, um, which became inspired. And what we call the Pinochet precedent or the Pinochet effect now has led to prosecutions of people like Alberto Fujimori in Peru and um, Rios Montt in Guatemala and cases in Spain against the murders of the Jesuits uh, in El Salvador. Just uh, a, a cascade of, of, of effort. San Habre now in Senegal, a the former A cascade of effort to hold the Pinochets of the world accountable for their atrocities. So it, it couldn't have been a more important uh, fundamental event. Uh, in our in our recent history, and you know, I, I just want to take it, the opportunity to be on your show and say that Juan Garcés is a hero, um, and what happened in Spain was a heroic, heroic uh, effort, um, and the fact that there's this straight line from 40 years ago to being at the La Moneda to then being in Spain and 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 being able to hold Pinochet accountable um, and create a very different set of circumstances for the dictators of the futures is is just is a tremendous achievement. Peter, uh, what has been the U.S. government uh, response to this concept of uh, universal jurisdiction? Well, there's a bunch of issues. In the aftermath of Pinochet's arrest, we in Washington took advantage of pressing the Clinton administration to declassify uh, the, the deep, the deep uh, uh, dark holdings of, uh, of the U.S. government on Chile, on the Pinochet era, and eventually the CIA operations in Chile itself. Uh, and the Clinton administration act, we, deserves a lot of credit. People inside that administration uh, despised Pinochet. Some of them had been Allende supporters in their youth. Um, and uh, the president was convinced to, to order a special declassification of 24,000 documents, including, in the end, 2,000 operational CIA documents, which we never would have seen otherwise, uh, that recorded the, the U.S role in, uh, in Chile, uh, Nixon and Kissinger's role in, in undermining democracy and supporting dictatorship. So this was the initial response of the United States. Overall, the United States doesn't like the concept of universal jurisdiction because they don't want other countries to prosecute U.S. officials for atrocities committed around the world. And uh, of course, we now have a whole team from the Bush administration, who could easily be prosecuted just as Pinochet was prosecuted. So how are they affected when they go abroad, including President <laughs> Bush, former President Bush? Well, I mean, uh, certainly there have been efforts made in Europe to uh, to question George Bush, to question Donald Rumsfeld. There have been. We were with people last night, John and I, uh, from the Center for Constitutional Rights, um, uh, Michael Ratner, and others who have tried to bring cases uh, against uh, former Bush administration officials for torture, for rendition, for, for death in the name of fighting terrorism. What um, do you see could happen to Henry Kissinger? Well, Henry Kissinger is 91 years old. Uh, and let me just take the opportunity to say that as Chileans are pushing their, uh, their society to atone for what happened 40 years ago, um, the issue is whether Kissinger will step up and, uh, and acknowledge and, and, uh, and apologize for uh, the crimes that he supported and helped perpetrate uh, in Chile. He's the last surviving member of that team. There's Kissinger and, uh, and to some degree, Bush have been what we call Pinochet. This is a new verb in the lexicon 
of uh, the human rights movement since Juan Garcés's accomplishment in getting Pinochet arrested. They uh, have faced the issue of when they travel abroad, will they be subpoenaed and questioned um, for uh, crimes that they supported, participated in, or instigated? And so you have a different situation for people like Henry Kissinger. He, he doesn't freely travel abroad. He now, particularly after Pinochet was arrested in 1998, he would send emissaries to make sure there wasn't going to be a problem. He went to France at one point in 1999, I think, uh, or 2000, and was served with a subpoena and promptly left. He was going to go to Brazil to receive a huge prize, and a judge in Brazil said, I'm going to question him on Operation Condor, and Kiss Kissinger canceled his trip. Uh, so, and Bush himself, George Bush, has also faced uh, to, to, to some degree this issue. I think the question is, you know, as, as Juan Garcés will say, um, Pinochet seemed untouchable for years and years and years, and then suddenly he wasn't because of the hard work. Juan Garcés, what do you think should happen with Henry Kissinger? By the way, I should also just say for folks who are called Juan in this country, uh, uh, it is spelled Juan Garcés, but the Catalonian form of Juan is Juan. Um, uh, so, Juan Garcés, what should happen with Henry Kissinger? Well, uh, uh, some of the victims of those crimes that we are talking about filed in the uh, district court of uh, Washington, D.C., a claim against Kissinger. Uh, unfortunately, the date uh, was not uh, positive. Uh, that was the day before the 9-11-2001. So, uh, uh, 13 years ago today. Yes, yes exactly. And so uh, this f uh, this claim uh, didn't uh, didn't uh, was not successful because the, co the district court uh, said that uh, the U.S. Court of Justice cannot review the decisions taken by uh, the State Department high officers, even if those decisions are related to crimes against humanity and uh, uh, genocidal acts. Uh, this decision was, uh, uh, was confirmed by the appeal court, and the Supreme Court of Justice uh, didn't accept uh, to review the, those decisions. I, th I think that this is very unfortunate. Uh, the, 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 the leaders of the United States have uh, extraordinary powers. If they uh, are, com are accomplices or commit crimes against humanity, they should uh, abroad, using the power of the United States to commit big crimes abroad, they should, uh, may, should be made accountable. They, could, they cannot be tried abroad, because no country, no court in the, in the world uh, uh, dares to uh, uh, open a, a serious criminal case against the higher. Uh, of, uh, high officer of the United States. And if the U.S. courts say that because of the separation of power they can no more investigate those crimes, the outcome is absolute impunity. And I think that this is unacceptable and that is a danger for we all. <laughs> and in fact, uh, you are talking about this, this, this Pinochet case. Uh, let me tell you that I, I am just following the path that was opened by the U.S. Uh, uh, government in 1945. When the uh, World War II was ending, it was a discussion among the leaders of the United Nations what to do with those big criminals that use the power of the Third Reich and uh, for committing massive crimes. And then there was a discussion uh, for the Prime Minister of uh, Britain, uh, uh, Churchill, the answer was very clear. You put them against the wall, ta -ta -ta -ta, finish, uh, you kill them. That is, uh, that is all. Uh, uh, Stalin agreed with that, uh, but not Roosevelt, not the, administration, the American administration that said, no, no, these people should face a tribunal where uh, their crimes should be exposed and then there was the Nuremberg uh, trial, that is the beginning of the current international criminal law. So the roots of the international law uh, presently are in the United States, think, strategic thinking for the, uh, the world after 
World War II. As you talk about international law, can I digress for one minute before we talk about the current election in Chile and ask you about your thoughts on Syria? Because what's often raised right now is that it's a violation of a hundred-year-old law about the use of chemical weapons. And President Obama drew this red line. He says the international community drew it and the ban against the use of chemical weapons. What are your thoughts on what should happen in Syria? Do you think the U.S. should uh, respond to this, though it's not completely the facts are not in on exactly who who did this uh, in Syria, but should strike Syria militarily? Well, in my view, the United States, Syria, and the world is facing now the, the, the consequences of a, a bad strategic options two years ago in Libya. Uh, According to the uh, international legal, uh, legal norms, the United Nations Charter, the legitimacy for, the, for using force against a sovereign government, a, a, an independent country, is in the Security Council of the United Nations. It's the only organ that can take the, those decisions. And uh, the United States asked the permission to, from the, United, the Security Council to protect the civilians of, in the eastern side of Libya against bombing by the Gaddafi government. And the Security Council agreed on that. Great. And then an exclusion zone was created for protecting the civilians. What was the mistake, in my point of view? They, they turned this authorization from the Security Council in a regime change, accepting to use this authorization from the Security Council to bomb all the areas of Chile, of uh, Libya, and permitting the overthrow of the uh, uh, Gaddafi regime. Then the Russians and the Chinese that were looking what has been done with the authorization that of they use of force to. that they in Libya, that, uh, they, in my analysis, said that is the last time. Uh, we will not co co accept that once again that we give the authorization for that, and that is a pretext for something that we didn't authorize. And that is the, 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 the tragedy for the Syrian, uh, Syrian people since two years ago, when the, uh, the Security Council is blocked. Now, uh, what I realize that uh, is a proposal for solving the, the situation in Syria. You have here uh, you, uh, the position that is being taken by the U.S. executive and a great skepticism uh, in, in other countries about the use of, uh, of force outside authorization of the Security Council, legitimate force. And I realize that some uh, governments, for example, the German government, is saying that uh, the people that is responsible for these chemical attacks should be made responsible in the International Criminal Court of Justice. And, uh, Which uh, the U.S. has not signed on to. But the Security Council can, uh, can uh, order that uh, the, these people in Syria that uh, has committed this crime uh, uh, being sent to the International Criminal Court. This is a legal solution, and uh, certainly the diplomatic uh, possibilities are not exhausted. And I, I consider uh, that after the experiences, uh, the fiascos in Iraq invasion, and uh, the answer to the uh, attack uh, to New York invading another country. Well, look at what happened in New York 10 years ago. Uh, that was a terrorist attack. Uh, to answer to the, this terrorist attack, there were several ways. The option was to invade the country, make the balance what is 10 years later the number of terrorists uh, 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 of uh, jihadists jisha, that are today and that were there. I think that this attack has multiplied the number of people that are ready to commit uh, new crimes. So uh, uh, I think that the use of force should be done, but through legitimate means. And uh, the use of force outside the legitimacy of the international law, the side effects are, in this case, it's evident, more negative than positive. That is my balance. Peter Kornblu, uh, turning back to 73, can you talk about the role of the CIA uh, in supplying lists of, uh, of dissidents to the Chilean military? Are there some evidence, although it doesn't really show up in the documents that we have, it was discovered by the uh, Senate committee led by Senator Frank Church, the so-called Church Committee that investigated uh, the U.S. intervention in Chile in the mid-1970s, that the CIA funded a particular institute that uh, was preparing for uh, a coup that did compile 
lists of both civilians and, and people inside the, the Allende government um, that would need to be uh, taken care of, if you will, um, in the event uh, of a coup. Um, the CIA eventually came in, sent a team to help create the Chilean uh, secret police, um, DINA. I was just in Chile, and there are very few DINA documents available. The DINA disappeared. Their archives, just like they disappeared so many victims. The head of DINA uh, was arrested Manuel and Manuel Contreras uh, was first prosecuted for the assassination of Orlando Letelier, the former Chilean ambassador to Washington, and his colleague Ronnie Carpenter Moffat. And then he was prosecuted again and again and again. Um, and he now has, is in a prison, uh, has been in a prison, and has an overall sentence of more than 200 years um, uh, to serve. But I was saying that the CIA actually um, sent a team to, to help uh, advise Dean on infrastructure, on human resources, on kind of the, how you do intelligence uh, operations. And one of the things I, I found when I was in Chile two, two weeks ago is that there's actually a, 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 a manual uh, that the Dean had on how to conduct intelligence that appears to be uh, completely translated from, from a, an old U.S. manual from the 1950s. Now, obviously, somebody gave the DINA that manual to, to, to use. So there's a, a, a history here of the CIA being involved with Chilean impression up to the point when Pinochet sends his, his, his assassins to Washington, D.C. to commit an act of international terrorism. Uh, we're, we're approaching 9-11 tomorrow. The Letelier assassination, a car bombing in downtown Washington, D.C., was the first act of state-sponsored international terrorism in the capital city of Washington. Um, very quickly, we just have a minute to go. The current election that's going on right now in Chile is remarkable. You have two women, one the former president, Michelle Bachelet, right, two daughters of generals. One may have been responsible for the torture and death of the other, Michelle Bachelet's father, killed. And they were childhood best friends now running against each other. Well, it's a historic election because you have two women contending for the presidency. It's the first in Latin America, maybe the first in the world, uh, where two women are the leading contenders for to be president. And because of their backgrounds, of course, and because of the confluence of the 40th anniversary arriving tomorrow um, uh, in the middle of this election, uh, the the history of the of the coup is kind of front and center uh, in the debate uh, over, over, over the issues, and the issue of atoning, apologizing for, taking responsibility for those who supported Pinochet. It has suddenly become politically expedient to, to apologize from the right-wingers, uh, and people even pushing Evelyn Matei to apologize for her father, to apologize for her family, for their participation uh, in the repression. Um, and, um, uh, and this is a, a, a sea change politically uh, in Chile, where the, the country has been divided, but now really um, it's, it, there's just very little space uh, for anybody to have supported the, the coup anymore and feel like they could ever advance politically in Chile. The population has changed. The, 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 the commemorations around the 40th anniversary, which is tomorrow, have been overwhelming in the press and the media, cultural events, a beautiful concert called Victor Sin Victor. Uh, on Victor Hara's music just took place last week. Um, it, uh, it's, it's, it was wonderful and inspirational to see, and it's a large part due to the, to, to the effort of Chileans and the effort of the world community to make sure uh, that the coup and its atrocities were repudiated. Well, I want to thank you both for being with us, Peter Cornblue and Juan Garces. Um, Juan Garces, by the way, is also winner of the Right Livelihood Award and was a gathering in Bonn a few years ago when we also interviewed him. A gathering of about 75 Right Livelihood Award winners uh, won that award. It was awarded in the Swedish Parliament. Uh, Juan Garces, again, um, uh, the closest advisor to President Allende. President Allende died in the palace September 11, 1973, 40 years ago. Uh, Juan Garces left the palace and, from that point to today, has been ten not only telling the world about what happened, but holding the forces that deposed Salvador Allende accountable. Thank you so much, both, for being with us. Pleasure.